Yes. Raise your hand if you have a free seat next to you so that people who are walking around can keep it up. It's only an hour. Actually, the room runs until 7 o'clock, so if you could keep your hand up until 7 o'clock, that would be great. Oh, sorry. All it's right. 12 o'clock. Maxim, take it away. All uh, right. It should be on, right? Yep. Uh, can you hear me right in the back? We're good? Good. All right. So uh, this talk is about multi-cloud CI CD with OpenStack and Kubernetes. Um, so if you're here for something else, you know, um, I don't know. So I'll start by um, presenting myself. I'm Maxime. I'm a cloud consultant. I help uh, companies with their public and private cloud projects. Uh, usually, it's like a combination of uh, OpenStack, Kubernetes, uh, Ceph, some CI/CD. Um, and kind of mix it all together to accelerate uh, development processes at um, different uh, companies and uh, allow them to uh, yeah, use the DevOps principles and so on. I'm also a contributor to all those projects, uh, GitLab, Helm, and a few others. So yeah, that's, I think, enough about me. You're not uh, here to <laughs> learn about that. Um, I'll get going with an introduction. So the, the talk is about multi-cloud, CI, CD, OpenStack, and Kubernetes. I'll go through those terms and see, kind of explain what I mean there and uh, why this might be of interest uh, to you. Um, so first, the multi-cloud uh, aspect. So multi-cloud there, I mean the fact of running across several clouds. Um, kind of self-explanatory, but uh, that's kind of what I mean with it, and other people might mean other things. Um, why do you want to do that, or why might you want to do that? You, have, uh, you could have lots of motivations there. Uh, usually, the, the most common uh, motivation for multi-cloud is around uh, residency or across several providers. So you don't want to put all your infrastructure eggs into the, the one basket. You want to spread the risk across several providers, say um, provider one and provider two, and if provider one has a huge uh, global outage, you can uh, still run your workloads on provider two uh, without any impact for your uh, customers. So that's like one of the motivations for, for multi-cloud is around residency and uh, mitigating uh, global outages of uh, cloud providers. Sometimes we see them in the news, uh, and it's nothing fun to have your applications uh, go down because of somebody else's uh, outage. Um, there is also like a vendor lock-in aspect. Uh, if you're running with a single cloud provider, you're kind of locked within their ecosystem. And that might be AWS, or that could be like an OpenStack-based uh, uh, cloud provider. You're still locked in with that provider, and uh, that's a risk if maybe tomorrow they decide to do something you, you don't like. Maybe they, they acquire a competitor of yours, or they, they start to increase prices. It's not a really good position to be in to, to have like a single uh, vendor to be locked in there. Um, so having several cloud providers is a way to mitigate this and uh, reduce the vendor lock-in. You could scale down your uh, infrastructure in that one cloud provider and then scale out into the other ones to like, switch over to another one. Um, there is also a cost motivation. If uh, you have uh, one cloud provider that has really good prices on one type of infrastructure, maybe it has really good prices on VMs, and another cloud provider has really good prices on uh, storage or GPU instances, you could take advantage of uh, the, the best in class or the best providers for those workloads and run some workloads in the one that has a good GPU instances and another one with some other workloads into the other provider that has uh, maybe a, a good uh, storage uh, services or things like this. Uh, this is also, lots of people want to do hybrid cloud strategy where they have a private cloud deployment on-prem, on usually OpenStack, but could be uh, some other uh, cloud platforms, and they want to run the baseline load on-prem and do cloud bursting into public cloud providers to handle uh, spikes around uh, maybe if you're an e-commerce website around you have like a sales period during Christmas or something like that, you could handle your spikes uh, there in the public cloud and use that only when you need it, and that could be like a cost uh, reduction thing for your infrastructure. 
Um, Multi-cloud is also around uh, features. Some cloud providers don't have GPU instances at all. Some cloud providers uh, have some features and some have other features, so you might be required to like, combine several cloud providers just because you need those two features and there's not one provider that has all of them. So that, that could be a thing as well. And, and kind of in that direction, you have the locations. Uh, maybe your application is uh, very latency sensitive and you want to, to be really close to your customers, maybe some live streaming thing or uh, some gaming platform, and you, you want to be really close to your uh, end users. And uh, there is not a single provider that has all the locations in the world, so you're going to need to like, combine different uh, infrastructure and, and, and make like a multi-cloud uh, strategy there. So those are like the motivations around the, the multi-cloud. Um, now let's go to the CI-CD aspect. So CI-CD is continuous in integration, continuous delivery. So to test the code continuously and then continuously deploy it to production as well. That's really what I mean with CI-CD. The, the motivation there is to, to allow your developers to fail fast. Uh, you want to go really quickly between the time when you have an idea and the time you can realize that idea and potentially fail because you don't want to invest like years of development to realize, oh, this is a bad idea. It doesn't work out. It's better if you can automate the whole process and, and uh, realize that early on. Right? So um, CI, CD, you will need a lot of automation. Uh, we don't want to, to rely on humans doing things. We want to automate as much as possible. Uh, for instance, we don't want to involve a DevOps team or hum like ops people to deploy uh, this new version of the software. This should be fully automated so we can reduce the, the cost of failures, for instance, and uh, accelerate the time to, to go into production. This is really important when you're doing multi-cloud because uh, when you start to have more than one location, if you do things manually, it's really difficult to keep the consistency across those locations. And you can really easily end up in uh, situations where you make a typo or, I mean, we're all humans, we make mistakes and it happens and, and you don't realize it right away and you end up in some bugs that are happening only in that one location, don't happen in the other ones, it's difficult to track down what's going on and it's not fun for your customers. So really important to automate this whole infrastructure CI CD uh, thing. Uh, let's see. And then we have um, OpenStack and Kubernetes. Um, here, um, so what is OpenStack? Because you might not know about OpenStack. It's like an API-driven uh, infrastructure platform. Uh, I see some people taking photos of the slides. Uh, there will be a link to the, um, to the slides at the end, so you can just wait for that if you can and uh, download them uh, later on. So back to OpenStack. It's an API-driven open infrastructure platform. So basically, it's like an API, and you can boot up VMs into uh, different uh, locations. Uh, there are around 60 cloud providers uh, around the world that provide uh, commercial services there. So you can go on their website, you register, and they are going to allow you to boot up VM on their infrastructure uh, for a fee, of course. And uh, you know, if you want to install OpenStack on-prem, that's also an option. So just to, to say that there's like an ecosystem around OpenStack that's quite large. And um, yeah, uh, then Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a container ecosystem, um, very developer-centric. So that's because developers can run Docker on their computer, and then they can package the application in the same way on the computer, on their laptop, as what will be run in production. That's like the portability of using containers. Uh, it makes troubleshooting much easier, and you don't end up in a situation where um, you have differences between your development environment, your staging environment, and your production environment. There, since you use containers, you have this portability and makes things more um, consistent across your environments. All right, so that's like the definition of the terms then. This is a diagram of like overview of how this kind of fits together. We have on the left-hand side uh, the, what I call the data plane. So you will have your users. They will talk to your application. And this is where you have your business logic. This is like your product, the thing you develop, like whatever it is. Um, your application will run on Kubernetes with some container uh, there. And then Kubernetes will run on OpenStack, kind of to clarify how like the big pieces uh, interact with each other. 
And then on the right hand side, we have uh, what I call the control plane. And this is where your DevOps uh, people, or your developers, or your operations people will, will work. They will work towards GitLab in, in this instance, uh, the CI CD platform, and this will talk to the different components and, and make the, the magic happen at the right time, at the right place. So uh, your developers can push a new version to your CI CD platform, and then it will make it happen in OpenStack, Kubernetes, and application, uh, wherever is needed. So this is kind of the, the idea. Container platform, infrastructure as service, and business logic on top. All right. Um, that's like the general thing. Um, now I'll go into the more technical aspects of it, so the architecture and how we can go from the web browser to uh, the global multi-cloud architecture. So it's maybe obvious to some people, but uh, your clients, they will, they, they will enter your, your, your application from like some form of DNS name. That's like the entry point uh, that they have. And they will type that in their web browser, and then DNS resolution will happen, and hopefully at one point they will reach your application. But since we want to do multi-cloud uh, architecture, we're going to need some form of global load balancing. Um, so this is really important, and this needs to happen really early on. So you have kind of different options there. You could use a CDN, and you might be already using a CDN for your application, uh, for caching or for accelerating things. So you could leverage features in your CDN provider to, to load balance things globally. So some CDN providers have like, uh, you can set policies and uh, routing rules and such. So this is like one option. Uh, another option that you have is to use uh, something at the DNS level, since the DNS is like the, the entry point here. Um, kind of three main approaches. You could use uh, some form of like geo-routing DNS. Uh, there is uh, Route 53 and DIN that have it as commercial services. And then on the open source front, uh, you can do things in bind, you can do things with uh, geo-DNS, you have like, lots of projects there that can help you. Um, but we'll need a bit of hands-on there to, to get that going. So GeoDNS is, the idea is to route the query to the closest server or closest cloud to the user, right? Um, and that works for most applications, uh, and some applications require it. Uh, another option, something you could do, is like some DIY dynamic DNS updates. So maybe you have like a background process that updates your DNS record on the fly based on whatever custom metrics you have that makes sense for your application. Uh, maybe you want to uh, like do this based on load or something like this. So this could be a simple cron job or something more complicated. It's kind of up to you. And uh, kind of the simplest option is to do DNS round robin. And there you just set several A records for uh, one DNS name, like one for each uh, cloud provider, for instance. Uh, the thing to know about DNS round robin is that you have very little control over how your clients will interpret this. So you, don't, you can't really um, control how the base will be load balanced. It's up to the client to, to handle the load balancing. So that, that doesn't work for all applications, but that's a solution that works for some, and that might work for you, and you know, it's very simple. All right, so we have our application. Uh, it goes through our global load balancer, and then we want to, oh, the request goes through the global load balancer, and then we want it to hit uh, one of our application containers, right? Uh, that's the next step in the chain. So in this example, we'll have like three example clouds. Um, one on the left, one in the middle, one on the right. And we'll have our application hit one of our uh, containers. But something we need to clarify is that for this to work out, your application needs to have certain properties. This will not work with uh, any kind of application. It needs to be some form of 12-factor application. If you know the 12 factor principles, um, the application needs to be dockerized, right? But we want to run this on Kubernetes. Kubernetes uses containers. So if our application is not dockerized, we can't run it on Kubernetes. Uh, for most languages, this is like a solved problem. You have uh, examples for like, all the main languages on how to dockerize applications. So that should be fine. Your application here, I'm going to assume it's HTTP based, some form of a web app with like a backend API, something like that. Uh, if you're doing something else, you know, it might work, it might not. It's going to be more complicated. And your application needs to 
to be distributed in, in, in some shape or form. Um, and there I mean the application is to be able to run into an active-active mode. So uh, several active instances working together. Uh, that's really important. So this doesn't work for all types of application, but most, I think. All right. So we have our application layer, and our application layer runs on top of Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is going to be our cloud abstraction, which will give us an API, so the Kubernetes API, which will abstract all the constructs from the underlying hardware and the underlying cloud providers. Each cloud provider is going to be unique. Here we have one layer that will give us uh, one API that uh, works across uh, cloud providers, being OpenStack, AWS, uh, whatever. It's really, really important to do uh, one cluster per location. You know, under no circumstances, you should do one cluster across several data centers. This is a really bad idea in terms of failure domain. Uh, you, you can lose Chrome very easily. This is just a source of problems. So one cluster per location, even if it's a small location with just one server, you know, Kubernetes can run on, on a single server. That's fine. Um, in terms of Kubernetes features, we will use uh, ingress controllers since it's an HTTP-based application. Uh, that's going to be our reverse proxy layer. And then we'll use some form of federation. And more on federation. All right. So uh, federation can mean several things based on what's your background. And I'll cover two and a half of those. Um, so federation, if you come like from an OpenStack background or IDP background, you're thinking mostly about authentication federation, kind of like single sign-on experience where you can uh, use one set of credentials or one token to access several platforms. So this is possible in Kubernetes and very much recommended as soon as you have several clusters, even if it's just test and prod. And the most common way to do this is uh, OpenID and uh, webhooks that are supported by the Kubernetes API server. Uh, the webhook way is very simple. Every time the API server will see a token that it doesn't know about, it will call that webhook that you configure, and that webhook is responsible to uh, identify if this token is valid, and if it's valid, who is it about, and which group this user or service account is uh, related to. So that's really useful if you have like uh, in-house uh, IDP or authentication solution and you want to like, integrate that in, in there somehow. Um, the simplest way is really the OpenID Connect uh, support in Kubernetes. Uh, you just have two flags that you need to set in your, your API server. That's OIDC issuer URL, OIDC client ID, and you are really good to go on the server side. You have lots of uh, OpenID Connect providers uh, that are available. You can use uh, Google, you can use GitHub, you can use GitLab, and there are plenty of uh, online services. And if you're into the self-hosted thing, you can use GitLab on-prem, Keycloak, and Dex. So you're probably already using one of those things, and it's really nice to be able to just drop it in and reuse your existing authentication platform. On the client side, it's a little bit um, more tricky since the clients, they will need to provide the token to identify themselves and most people uh, are not really, uh, they don't really know how to do that. So you could do DIY and there's like a kubectl command to, to, to set that in your client, this uh, auth provider or IDC, and then you need to pass it the, the refresh token, your ID token and a bunch of stuff. Or you can use like a web interface called Kubros that will be more a bit later that generates your kubectfg, kubeconfig file and you just drop it in and that's it. So this automates the process for your DevOps or your Kubernetes API consumers. So this is really interesting. Uh, you have another Kubernetes federation is kubefed that was called before Ubernetes and this is a completely different concept. There is one API to roll them all basically is the idea you have one Kubernetes API, and that Kubernetes API talks to a bunch of different clusters and make things happen. This is really good, cool idea, but um, it started out as uh, kubefed v1, which was discontinued last year, and was supposed to be replaced with kubefed v2, which is work in progress. 
So as operators, we're kind of left in this in-between situation where we don't really know what to do. Should we go with kubefed v1, which works only with kind of old version of Kubernetes and is not really supported? Or should we go with an in-development version kubefed v2 and cross our fingers? So this is a bit of a tricky situation and yeah, it's how uh, things are and I'm sure contribution is uh, welcome in this uh, kubefed uh, uh, project, uh, but in the meanwhile, I'm gonna choose to do some uh, DIY magic in, the, in GitLab to handle the several clusters. And then later on, when kubefed v2 becomes uh, ready, then we can backport that and fix things later, hopefully. So that's that for Kubernetes Federation. And then we have OpenStack at the bottom. Um, well, OpenStack runs on hardware, but you know, we are talking clouds, so we are abstract that. Um, in OpenStack terms, we are gonna need some Nova instances, so those are basically VMs, some security, security groups, and that's basically firewall rules that are applied on each uh, virtual port in the libvirt. And then uh, we're gonna need a set of key pairs for handling SSH access in a secure manner, and server groups. Server groups is somewhat optional, but if you're really serious about this, it's not optional. Uh, so server groups is like a mechanism where you tell this group of servers, I don't want them to run on the same hypervisors. And this is not something you think about maybe from day one, but once you have a hypervisor going down and you have all your ETCD node there, then you notice. So think about that uh, in advance if you're deploying Kubernetes on any platform, really, actually. You should be careful about uh, those things. Um, on the Neutron side, uh, so that's the networking project in OpenStack, we're just gonna use uh, a network, a subnet, a router, and a set of floating IPs. So floating IPs is basically public IPs that are uh, mapped uh, in. So we are using really basic uh, constructs in OpenStack. We're not using any of the fancy features. Uh, keeping things simple, this is the, the key features in OpenStack, the most m mature features. So this is what we, we use there. All right, so that's that for the, the, like the architecture. That's a lot of like things, a lot of pieces. We're gonna need some tooling to, to make that happen in an automated fashion, right? I'm gonna present a set of tools. Those are the tools I think are most popular. Uh, I'm not like endorsing one in particular. If you have another tool that you like most, you know, cool, that's fine. Uh, you know, some people are very opinionated about tools and such, so what works for you, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, splitting this in kind of two sections, two big sections, there's the infra tools, so those are the tools that we will use to to manage the, the VMs, basically. We're gonna need to populate some VMs, and we want some tooling with that. We don't want somebody sitting in the web UI or in the CLI and like, uh, OpenStack create VM or whatever. So uh, I'll start with the OpenStack native tool, which is called Heat. That's an like, OpenStack project that's handling automation. You pass it a file that describes how you want your infrastructure to look, and it's gonna make sure that those VMs and networks and floating IPs uh, become available to you. Um, this, is, this works really well. The kind of two downsides there is that it's a small-ish ecosystem, so it's difficult to find examples on GitHub or wherever is it you, you, you look. Um, so you need to do a lot of DIY and a lot of, like, you need to know about heat. You need to have expertise in heat. Um, and it's OpenStack only, right? You can't use OpenStack heat in Google Cloud, so you're gonna you need to use another tool anyway for that. So kind of here what I'm saying is, if you know Heat, if you're using Heat, if you're OpenStack only, that's, that's probably a good choice, but if you want to do multi-cloud across different providers, different like, software providers like OpenStack and CloudStack and Google Cloud, you're probably out of luck. You have uh, Ansible as another option, and there I'm talking specifically about the Ansible cloud modules. So Ansible is really big, I'm talking only about the cloud modules. So those are like the OS underscore server modules, uh, that uh, allow you to talk to the Kubernetes API into like a YAML uh, Ansible uh, module thing. And this has, is a lot more mature, has support for AWS, Google Cloud, OpenStack, VMware, like a bunch more platforms. 
um, and you probably already know Ansible, and you probably already use it in some places in your company. So that could be a nice choice, you know, based on your team and what they know. Um, last tool is Terraform, and Terraform is a tool that is designed for infrastructure management, whereas Ansible does lots of stuff, and infra management is one of those things. Terraform does infra management only. So a little bit of a different approach there, and um, that is visible in the features that you have in Terraform. For instance, you can, w w when you run Terraform, it asks you, this is what I'm about to do. Are you really sure this is, you know, what you want to do? So you can review that. In Ansible, it's not so easy to make this kind of um, prompts and uh, plans and such. And since uh, Terraform is focused on uh, infra management, it has a huge amount of platforms that are supported. So it, if you're into like some exotic platforms, this is probably a good way. All right, so now that we have our list to the tool for our, the infra management, and then we'll want to install Kubernetes on that, right? So if we, I will start again with the OpenStack native tool, which is Magdom, which is an OpenStack project, and has kind of the same downsides as Heat. So if you're OpenStack only, if you know uh, OpenStack really well, this is like a good way to go. It uses Heat in the background to do stuff. And, uh, works really well. It's kind of a small ecosystem. Last I checked, there was no Ansible cloud module for it, so you need to double check those things, I think. Um, you have some other tools that are available to install Kubernetes. You have COPS, for instance, and this one is not OpenStack at all. It's only AWS, so you, know, you could use different tools. Maybe you use uh, uh, Magnum for your OpenStack stuff and uh, COPS for your AWS stuff. Same thing with Rancher. Rancher doesn't really have like native OpenStack support, but has support for AWS, Google Cloud, VMware, and a few other platforms. So there you could also combine Rancher with Magnum if you want. And uh, lastly, KubeSpray is also like a, a popular uh, deployment tool for Kubernetes, and it supports uh, OpenStack, AWS, Azure, bare metal, vSphere. Uh, really, it doesn't care where you your VMs are where your, your operating system is. It just, it's a set of uh, Ansible playbooks. So it just needs an IP address with SSH open, and that's all what it cares about. So this is uh, really the only way if you want to do, or one of the most common ways if you want to do uh, Kubernetes on bare metal functions. And the nice thing with KubeSpray is that it comes built in with a set of uh, Terraform recipes or plans that you can directly use for AWS and OpenStack. So if you don't know Terraform, you could just use those and you know, get going that way. So that's that for the tools. No, one the CI tools. Um, so we're going to need some CI tools. I talked about GitLab before, but if you use Jenkins or whatever, that's fine with me as well. I'm just like, very familiar with GitLab, and uh, I like that the integration with the Git repo directly and the merge requests. It's an uh, all-in-one solution. I think it's uh, kind of neat for the CI part. Um, but you know, if you want to use Zool or Jenkins or some commercial solution, that's fine as well. Uh, in terms of your like application pipeline, you're gonna want to do something like run some checks, make sure that this commit uh, makes any sense. Is this like something worth compiling at all? Then we're gonna build this. So Docker build, which will probably compile um, the code and make a container image. Then we're gonna run some tests. We want to make sure that that container image, you know starts and has a web server listening on whatever port it's supposed to expose. And then run that into whichever environment it's supposed to run. So if you're on the master branch, you're gonna run that in your production environment, and if you're on the topic branch, you're gonna run that into your test cluster, right? So that's like the CI aspect. There's also like a new trend that's a new set of tools that are starting to emerge. Those are like the GitOps tools. Things like with Flux and Argo CD. Um, I don't have time to, to uh, like include that in the demo, maybe for some other time. So it's a different concept. It's more like you have an agent running in your cluster, and it will ask some central Git repo to, to see, should I apply something? So whereas the CI approach is your CI contacts your cluster. In the GitOps uh, tools, it's your cluster contacts your CI. So this is interesting for people who 
don't have public IPs, uh, maybe they are running uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster in shops and they have dynamic IPs or whatever. So different you know, tools that you have at your disposal. All right, yes, so that's it for the tools now. Now it's the demo time. So all the source code of the demo is available at the URL below, gitlab.com slash multicloud dash openstack openstack dash k8s. Uh, have a look there if you want. Uh, the link is in the slides. Right. So I talked a lot about different solutions, different options, but for the demo you have to choose something, right? So I selected DNS round robin because I don't have access to a CDN and you know this is what I had access to. Uh, I used Kubespray, I used Terraform, and for Terraform I used the recipes or the plans that are built in Kubespray. Uh, GitLab CI with the, what they call the auto DevOps feature, and that's basically a wrapper around Docker build, Helm install. So if you're using any other CI tool, that's cool, you know, just do something like that. And the demo, if it works, uh, runs on 27 different data centers operated by 18 different companies and they run OpenStack from version Havana which is like, I don't know, three, four years ago to Rocky which is like latest release. So kind of to show like it's a huge variety of data centers, different versions and the idea is if there is a bug in one version that affects you, hopefully it doesn't affect everybody, right? Again, the source code is linked there. I need to give a big thank you to all the cloud providers that are participating. Uh, so all those different companies are uh, providing some uh, resources to make this demo happen. And big thank you to them, otherwise uh, without them it wouldn't be possible. Uh, right. Now, demo. Right, so I'm gonna switch windows and I hope it will be visible in the back. All right. So if you go to the link that was in the slides where the, the, the source code is, you have four repos, uh, one called Docker Kubespray Ansible, and that's basically a utility image, uh, nothing special in there, just pre-installed tools to make the CI pipeline go faster. Then there is the auto deploy app, that's a Git repo containing uh, what's called a Helm chart. That's a fork of the upstream GitLab one and a couple of modifications to make it um, multi-cloud uh, compatible, let's say. So very few modifications there. And then the two most important repos are app and clusters. Uh, app is my demo app, and this is just some hello world thing I wrote. And clusters is the repo that handles the infrastructure as code management of all the Kubernetes cluster across the 27 locations. And some uh, other things. Right, so, oh, not the token. That's fine. <laughs> the app, all right, so this is the Hello World app. Uh, it just says Hello World and it shows the city that is uh, serving the, the request. So right now we are hitting Gravelin, and that's in the north of France. And uh, if we like refresh, it might uh, hit some other uh, location. And I should there is some uh, feedback going on a bit north. Um, to enable the VPN. So, like I said, uh, since it's doing um, DNS round robin, it's completely up to the client uh, what happens with those things. And on Mac, natively, it really sticks to the one uh, record it has. So it was sticking to Gravelin. Now I VPN through something else, and uh, now we're hitting Amsterdam. So, DNS round robin is really just for the demo. It's mm, probably not a great idea to use that in production, especially in this example, since you have so many locations. Um, all right, this is the repo app that contains a Docker file and app.py. Docker file is really simple. We just uh, install the requirements from pip uh, and then we run gunicorn with our uh, app. The app is just few, like what, 50 lines or so. 
uh, talks to some API to fetch those nice images based on the, the location and then shows uh, some uh, HTML thing. And the HTML comes from this templates folder, which is using Jinja to like, make things look nice. All right, so, all right, that's that. I will go over to index.html. And here I can go hit edit. And I will change hello world from to hello false then 2019. And I will commit into master, which you should not do, but uh, yeah, uh, we don't have time for the demo to run a topic branch and then merge that later to master. So, you know, hello false then. At least we have a commit message. Um, yeah, so it, just follow your development workflow there, you know, topic branch and then merge requests, uh, second pair of I for review and then you know, merge that. But it's a demo. Then I'm gonna hit uh, pipelines. Oh, yeah. It'd be good if, uh, and then we have our GitLab CI going. Uh, so we're running uh, build and test at the same time. You probably want to like do some pre-flight checks before. I kind of narrow down the pipeline to as short as possible to have a demo of reasonable time. Uh, and then uh, we have all the CI jobs to deploy in all the different locations, right? And I made a small web app to visualize that. So currently everything is green and then things will start to change colors as we have our Docker image built and we will start to deploy stuff in different locations. Right. This takes a few minutes, so keep that in mind and I will demo another thing while this builds, all right? So we're not stuck here for a long time. So I will try to move this over here and then resize this like so. All right, so now I'll talk a little bit about the cluster management repo. So there's a clusters repo that has really two scripts, up.sh and down.sh. Up.sh boots up a new clusters with Terraform and then runs kubespray to install Kubernetes there. And down.sh destroys everything in that data center. Really simple stuff. And then we have the CI there as well. Yeah, so you can see on the right hand side that stuff is being deployed as we speak, right? Um, all right, so the pipeline for clusters is really simple. On the left hand side you have CI job to deploy clusters and on the right hand side to destroy them. So I just click uh, this button to rerun the CI there, I install it, and this one to destroy it. All right, so stuff is still being deployed. Now I will show the um, the Kubernetes thing and how we can see the Kubernetes API. So I'll come back over there. In clusters repo, there's a oh, call, folder called Kubros, and then we'll just do Kubros sage. This will run Kubros locally on my machine, but you should really run this as a web service somewhere. And I'll copy this. We'll open it. Ah, that's no good. All right, let's disable this. Maybe the Wi-Fi will. All right. So then I hit the signal sign-on or the IDP, ID, identity provider here on GitLab.com, and it asks me, are you sure you want to give a token to the Kubernetes demo? Yes. And then it tells me everything is good. I can download the config file. Uh, I can leave this. Then I can move the config file from my downloads folder into, it's cut, but it's dot cube slash config. Then I can do kubectl uh, config get context. And we can see all the different data centers we have. Then we can do kubectl uh, get pods. Yeah, I did this before. <laughs> 
minus n app to select the namespace in Kubernetes and dash dash context London. So this we should see the pods running in London. And now I can see, let's see the pods running in uh, Amsterdam. And this is, you know, all from one CLI. I don't have to like configure too much. Uh, and uh, something we can try is to uh, delete this pod here. And I've set some RBAC policies so that this access is only read-only. Uh, so it says, no, you cannot delete pod. And this is just an example of RBAC policies in Kubernetes. So you could say this guy is allowed to delete stuff, and this one is not. Anyway, uh, that's the kubectl uh, kubernetes thing. And now we can come back here, and we see all our deployments are good. And uh, we can uh, see it's all green. Perfect. And if I refresh this, now it says hello FOSDAM in Oslo and stuff like this. And now we hit Berlin, and you get the idea, San Jose, and stuff like this. I kind of focused on Europe, but yeah, we have data centers in Tokyo and stuff like this as well. And that's why DNS round robin kind of sucks, because the, day you, the time when you hit Tokyo, you get very high latency. But you know, that's that. And the last part of the demo, we still have uh, nine minutes, so I will do that, is uh, yeah, the token, I can close that. Uh, San Jose data center, I will just... Uh, go here, and I will just destroy it. So I click this button, and now it starts a CI job that will first go to my DNS provider to remove the DNS record from the round robin. Then we will wait for 60 seconds for the TTL to pass, and then to Terraform destroy, and the cluster is gone. And then we can refresh the page, and the client will just move on to another provider. Uh, now we're waiting for the DNS propagation. Um, uh, that takes a few seconds, like I said. And that's kind of that. I'll just finish up the slides. There's just a conclusion slide, because this way we have time for questions. All right, so where is it? Here. Wrap up. So to wrap things up, KubeFed V2 is coming, and it's kind of a pain, the situation where V1 is out and V2 is not is in progress. Uh, OpenStack interop is really hard. Uh, I use, what, 18 provider or something, and each of them is kind of unique in their own way, and it's really difficult to identify all the ways they are unique and uh, manage those things. So some guys will have firewall rules for you, some guys will have support for neutron routers, some won't, some will have support for floating IPs, some won't, some like different operating system images, they will bake in some stuff. It's the last slide, so you know, you can wait five seconds. Uh, some will have uh, custom operating system images, they will not use the upstream Ubuntu image, they will just build their own and with a bunch of stuff in there different VM sizes, and also keeping those things over time. Sometimes they just change, change IDs or change version of this and that, and it can be tricky. So uh, if you want to do this uh, multi-cloud thing, just think about um, if you're going to work with exceptions or using the common denominator across all your providers or all your clouds. And that's really a like, per cloud, per application decision. Uh, too many exceptions will add a lot of work for you, uh, but the common denominator might not be good enough. So you have to look on a case-by-case -case basis. And kind of my conclusion is we need to start looking at cloud providers as cattle, right? Kind of before we would treat servers as pets, where we would have our pet server and you know we would fix it. But now it's time for clouds to be like that. Oh, Amazon is down. I just destroy everything I have there and move on to the next one. I don't really care about one specific cloud provider or not. And that's, that's it for that. Links to the slides. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.